Hey everyone, it's Donna Cravata and this is The Real 50 Over 50 and we're here this week with Nicole lewis Keeber, one of my favorite people in the whole world and um, we are going to talk about trauma today and you're going to learn some stuff <laughs> if you're watching live um get involved in the conversation and do the same if you're watching the replay too and um nicole really knows her stuff and one of the things that she does um is she helps people fall in love with their business and have their business love them back and what she does is helps you to not bring your your um, trauma into your business. And if you did, she helps you kind of like invited to leave. <laughs> so I am just going to hand this over to Nicole and let her give a proper introduction of herself. And then we are just going to jump right in. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Um, you're one of my favorite people, too. So any time I can spend with you is always good. And um I, again, my name's Nicole Lewis Kieber. I have a master's degree in social work. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I was a psychotherapist for 18 years before leaving direct practice to work with small business owners and entrepreneurs and leaders. And my clients call me the business therapist, so I have continued to use that title because it, it seems appropriate uh, because they say, it feels like you got me and my business together in a, in a session and got us on the couch to work things out because... Our relationship is uh, not is broken and it's not working. Um, and so I've been doing research and study on the impact of childhood trauma on entrepreneurship and have written a little bit about that in my book, How to Live Your Business. So, um, so yeah, I'm a business therapist, author, the creator of the Do No Harm program for, for trauma conscious entrepreneurs. And my passion is to help people recognize how... Um, Childhood trauma is a thing, and it's a thing that finds itself in a lot of places in our lives we don't expect it, including our business, perhaps our money, our career, and that it's okay because you're a really good company and that we can work to help you extricate it uh, from yes. your business so that you can have a healthier relationship with it. Yes, and it's possible because Nicole has helped me do that. <laughs> yeah, it is um, possible. I, I remember I was once in a really difficult situation and you said something to me that totally turned things around, like on a dime. Mm -hmm. You just said, um, it's either them or it's you mm -hmm. because I was putting everybody before me. And you said that to me and it was just like everything went click, 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 click. <laughs> and it wasn't, um, that I should go out and like, you know, burn things down or be a vigilante in my life in any way. But, you know, it was just really clear when you said that to me was that like, you know, somebody's going to pay a price somewhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the them gets really loud, doesn't it? Because we are so taught that the them matters more than us. Yeah. You know, we yeah. cater to the them and it's, it yeah. helps us in ways, you know, in our, yeah. our lives. And, so, and, and, and quite honestly, you know, it's uncomfortable for a little bit and then the them doesn't even really care anymore. Exactly. <laughs> like you carry this stuff around in a light blue Samsonite for And you're like, decades. shit, they didn't even care. <laughs> or they completely forgot I exist in two weeks. Wow, that was really quick. Exactly. Exactly. So, okay. I want to, I want to dive into some good stuff here. So I'm just going to go right for the biggie. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what trauma is and what trauma isn't because I, um, we have had this discussion, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one and in groups with other people, but you know, there is a buzzword of trauma out there yeah. and, um, trauma is not a trend. It's not, a, you know, it is, it is life altering, generation altering, community altering, organization altering. And, um, you know, those $7 NLP courses and the likes um, are not doing any, any of us any good. So let's let's rip this apart. Mm -hmm. Like what is trauma and what isn't trauma? And yeah. you, and unleash, my friend, unleash. <laughs> right. And it's so interesting because the definition keeps changing for me, too, because I just finished reading um, a book by Dr. Um, 
Mary Catholic, Catherine eh, McDonald called Unbroken. And so even after reading her, her book, it, it continues to evolve for me. So I'm, I'm always like, okay, so if all of the people in the, you know, the clinical world can't always agree what trauma is, how is it that everybody else is so emphatically knowledgeable about what it is and just wants to say it is this and that is it. This is how you fix it. Um, but what it, what it comes down to me is it's, it's an experience that you have had and it can look different for everyone that was beyond your emotional and nervous system capability of processing and, and managing. And that could be for a lot of reasons. And I educate on this every day. And I use the terms big T, little t trauma. Some people don't like that. Um, but I have found it to be very useful to delineate, even though they're both very powerful to delineate, because a lot of people are walking around with trauma that don't know that they are, mm -hmm. because it is very, it's very easy for us and beneficial to us as a society, a culture, and the systems around us to not let us actually see some of the experiences that we had through the trauma lens, but to just tell us, well, that was just about childhood. Everyone, mm -hmm. everyone experienced that. So I always tell people that big T trauma are you know, kind of big life-changing moments. It, it can be domestic violence. It can be um, PTSD from combat. It can be um, maybe you had a, a natural disaster or, or catastrophic illness, something like that, that is big and it changes things pretty dramatically and pretty rapidly. And you have, usually have very little control over, you know, what is happening. Um, and if I were to ask most people, they would tell you that that's trauma. Like big T trauma is like their only way of looking at trauma. They'd say that's what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and I personally think that's by design just because, but that's for another day. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But there's also something called little T or small T trauma, which are cumulative experiences that you have over your developmental years, like your childhood, that change how you see yourself. It changes how you uh, value yourself, what you believe is possible for yourself. And they can be anything from having a learning difference like I did, being the new kid on the block all the time, having a parent that was ill that you had to take care of or be grow up really quickly. Um, a lot of experiences that people would say, yeah, that's not trauma. It was just unfortunate. But your mm -hmm. nervous system doesn't care what you label it. Your mm -hmm. nervous system is having the reaction and the response to it. And it changes your future. It changes how you see yourself. And we adapt. And those mm -hmm. trauma adaptations and patterns inform what we do in our adulthood, how we see ourselves, what is possible. So I always say that big T trauma explodes, little T trauma erodes, but they are both powerful enough to move a mountain. Um, and so we need to take a look at them because there's a lot of people who just think, well, you know, I, we were, I was always a new kid. And so I just yeah. learned how to make friends. Well, oftentimes you didn't learn how to make friends. You learned how to suppress who you were in order to mm -hmm. fit in so that you would have yeah. a peer group. That's a big damn difference, isn't it? It is a big difference. And the thing is, too, is like if you were raised in a, a certain environment and, you know, everyone else around you had a similar environment, you're not feeling like there was anything different. Like you grew up thinking everybody grew up this way because my friends grew up this way and my neighbors grew up this way and the kid around the corner grew up this way. Um, but you don't realize how that's just not true until you put yourself into a different situation. Yeah. yeah. And not to your nervous system. Your nervous system doesn't really no. care. No. That it's the, the body form. It's store. still having the reaction. It's the happening. It's happening. Yeah. yeah. And, and then you recreate it, right? Mm -hmm. So you recreate Absolutely. it in other relationships and your work mm -hmm. life and your businesses. And yes. what it's so, um, can you explain a little bit of what that looks like? Like if, if a little T trauma is not tended to, how, how does that get carried forth into your adult life? So, it, it, yeah, <laughs> so it can, it can do a lot of things. Um, yeah. I specifically uh, had someone I was speaking to about this and she's told me I can use this, this story where she had an experience when she was very young, where she had a best friend and um, they walked to school together every day. And eventually uh, she couldn't keep up with her friend physically. Um, and so her friend was always out front. And then eventually her friend got to school before her and um, it led to them not being as close anymore because they, they literally, she couldn't literally couldn't keep up with her physically. 
And she just remembered this as a story, right? Um, but in a partnership in a business that she was in where she was feeling always behind and giving more because she didn't think she belonged there, um, that small T trauma that she had of that loss of that primary and important relationship was informing her fear and anxiety about this partner leaving her in the business. And it was very disruptive and toxic to their, their relationship and she couldn't figure it, figure it out. So when we were able to connect those dots for her, everything changed. So that's just kind of one example of how something that seems very seemingly insignificant um, mm -hmm. had a big impact on how she saw herself and then adapted her behavior to uh, be of service to other people to try and hang on mm -hmm. to those relationships because she was af afraid that she would be left behind. So um, it could also be like for me, I had a learning disability growing up. And so the way that I saw myself was that I was stupid and I was told I was lazy. All of those things um, really changed how I saw myself as an adult. And it came with me into my own business. You know, when I think about um, do I measure up to other people and I want to talk about trauma and entrepreneurship and is it academic enough? Am I doing enough around it? So, you know, that little T trauma that I have is something I always have to work on within my own business to remind myself that I was not stupid. I certainly was not lazy. It was the system around me that did not know how to teach me. Um, yeah. so yeah, but it's hard. It's something I have to, to stay on top of. It's hard. And then, you know, there's such a distance of like what happened in your childhood to like what's happening in your life present day that mm -hmm. so many people do, do. They just don't draw the lines to connect it. No, it just becomes part of us and secondhand mm -hmm. and such a pattern mm -hmm. that we don't even recognize that there is a possibility that it doesn't have to be that way and that we could actually look mm -hmm. at ourselves and experience our life, our career, our business in a a more healthy and supportive light. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I met up recently with two of my girlfriends from when we were, we've been friends since we were four years old. And one of the things that um, one of my friends brought up that I had totally forgotten about was we would walk to school together when we were in like the first grade. And one of my friends had this really long scarf and we would tie this scarf around the three of us. And that's how we would walk to school every day. And when we sat and spoke about that as adult women, um, we talked about how like we were so important to each other. And that that's like, that was kind of like the glue that held us together because we were really there for each other through some, mm -hmm. some things that like first grade girls should not have to go through. First grade, anybody should not have to go through. And it was really a profound conversation that like we knew how to protect ourselves without, you know, we had no guidance, you know, there was nobody right. there helping us through that. Um, and, and I, I, when I was driving home that day, I was thinking of you and I was thinking of the work that you do. And I was thinking like, like, what did that one action like save me from, save them from yeah. like, you know, just being able to inherently know how to do that. Like what would have that turned into if we didn't do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's profound to think about. And it also just shows you how intuitive our nervous systems are in taking in the, the data around us about what we need to be safe and what need we need for protection. Yeah. 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 And, and what's really funny is one of my friends, um, I, we got together again, again, I don't know, it was a couple of years ago. We get together like every two years or so, but we, we, we stay connected. Um, but she, she, without even remembering this whole thing, because only one of us remembered this, and this was the other friend, but she crocheted us all of these wraps. So like on some level, like she was just, you know, providing that comfort again mm -hmm. that we needed when we were six or seven years mm -hmm. old. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's just amazing how like these things have this impact. And, and then it, it, you know, it impacts how you have relationships with other people, whether it's a child and like the next generation or not, it could be a spouse, it could be, uh, you know, a friend, it could, it could be anybody. And um, we don't realize the power of that. We don't realize the power of, of an act of kindness or, mm -hmm. 
you know, just taking the time to truly listen to somebody and yeah. understand, you know, have empathy, listen with empathy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's powerful. It is very powerful. It is very powerful. And then uh, the work that you do is, I mean, I think it's life-saving. I know I feel it's been life-saving for me. Mm -hmm. um, definitely business saving a couple of times. <laughs> and, <Yeah. laughs> and the other thing I really want to kind of talk about is how this is work that you should not try to do alone. Mm -hmm. And you really yeah. need a guide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I feel like that we are kind of in a place of shift right now where more and more people are, are interested in doing this work than I've ever seen, you know, um, which is why we see a lot of the trauma informed lingo out there mm -hmm. and a lot of, um, you know, people in helping type professions, whether they're coaches or uh, anything like that, you know, are coming out to talk about trauma because it, it is something that people are interested in. But my concern continues and has always been that, um, you know, you, I would say you can't read your own label. So you need someone to mm -hmm. hold space for you to help you. And you need someone who's trained and understands how trauma works and shows up. And that can help you with your with like nervous system regulation. Um, and you deserve that. You deserve to have that care and compassion so that you can let go. You can let down your defenses so that you can have time just for yourself to fall apart if you need to, or learn mm -hmm. how to relearn how to speak to yourself or to understand mm -hmm. how your nervous system um, is doing its job and sometimes overkill. Uh, but I see a lot of harm happening from people who are, um, you know, putting together quick programs or, you know, really short engagements where they're just, they're rattling people's, uh, trauma without a lot of good aftercare and integration time. It takes time to integrate mm -hmm. these yeah. things. So it is not something that I would want anyone to do alone. I was a therapist for 18 years. I had a therapist to help me work through my own trauma because yeah. it's really hard sometimes for us to recognize that something is trauma. I was doing the same thing, sitting in the therapist chair, minimizing my experiences and not calling them trauma. So we need that help and that support. It is not something that, um, we can do effectively on our own. No, I think it does more harm than good because um, you kind of get stuck in this in-between place. Mm -hmm. Yes, you re-traumatize so, yourself basically is what you do. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And um, how, what, what are a couple of other examples of you know, the way that the trauma will show up in your business if it's not yeah. addressed. Yeah. So um, it always shows up in our money. It, it's just, that's one of the primary places that it shows up um, with, you know, difficulty in charging appropriately, you know, um, expressing your value in a way that works for you and your business. So it's not, uh, I think, a coincidence. A lot of the work I do initially with people around this is to help them understand how trauma is impacting their money. So mm -hmm. I'd say money is a primary way in that, um, you know, giving away a lot of things, undercharging, not being competitive, not paying yourself, you know, all these things. So they, they are ways that, you know, um, trauma can show up and challenging your worth and your value. So that's one more obvious way, but I think that people don't always recognize that there's some other, other ways that it comes up that I, I saw in my research. And one is trust. Trust is a real big one. Um, and so if you are someone who's had wounding around your trust, often what happens is you will then decide like, okay, so I'm going to be in control. I'm going to trust myself. I'm not going to trust anybody else. And so you can um, I see people who build very, very successful businesses on their work alone, right? They don't have anybody else. They, they're very successful. And at some point, they want to change their, their business model, which requires them to then trust other people 
with their work. It, it requires them to hire employees or to delegate. And that is when things can become very challenging for them because they've not had to do that because trust felt dangerous. Mm -hmm. And if you can't rely on someone, which is relying on someone is the behavior of trust, it causes all kinds of problems in a business where you spend all this money hiring employees and then not allowing them to do their job. Like you keep inserting mm -hmm. yourself into the thing. Um, you don't, you know, trust a client when they say that they want to work with you. They say, yes, you're all excited. And then you start to second guess, you know, like, well, I wonder what they really want. Or, you know, they already said yes to this amount of money, but maybe I should do something else, you know, um, so I think trust is a huge way that trauma shows up in our business, whether it's not trusting ourselves or trusting other people. Um, and I do a lot of work with people on building trust within and, and building trust with others and figuring out what it means to delegate and then release. Because if you mm -hmm. don't release, then you are still involved and you're not getting any re the relief that you're okay. looking for. So yeah, yeah no. truth. I mean, big yeah, one. that is, and I, I, that's me. And yeah. hey, it's a lot of people. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was, you know, I was the one responsible for my family at a very young mm -hmm. age. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I took care of everything. Nobody could do every, anything the way I can. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, now we just had this, like, I've, I'm very mindful and very actively breaking cycles with my son. Yeah. And he's about to turn 21. And one of the things that he's been challenged with is stepping into my shoes to take care of himself. And he's like, I can't do it as well as you can. And I said, well, you have mm -hmm. to learn. Mm -hmm. So we've been working on that because I don't want him to be in that cycle. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I keep pushing him to do things on his own and show him like, you know, I've become the mom Sultan now. I'm not his mom anymore. <laughs> <laughs> he just mom calls Sultan. Me. I'm the mom Sultan, but you know, it's, it, you know, it's just such an interesting dynamic to have been um, at such polar opposite sides of being the parent as a child and now the parent as a parent. <laughs> yeah. Very enlightening. I'm sure different choices yeah. were made. And what I love what you're doing with your son is that, we can't make these changes overnight. You can't triple no. your prices as a business owner overnight. Your nervous no. system doesn't have the capacity for that. And no. so it's all about extending and opening that window to tolerate trust, to tolerate charging more. That takes mm -hmm. time. And we're going to do it slowly so you can integrate it. So yeah, um, and, and I so love that you're just like, you're on your own, figure it out. <laughs> that wouldn't be helpful. <laughs> No, no, no. I, I, I tell him, you know, like we had a whole conversation about this. I mean, we agreed on the mom Sultan role and, you know, and that I would tell him if he was embarking on something that he couldn't do alone, mm -hmm. you know, just from my own experience. And, you know, we had some good fights about it, but you yeah. know, it's all part of the process. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course it is. And, um, but, you know, I also attribute, you know, the healing work that I've done. Mm -hmm. because I probably wouldn't be doing, you know, raising him the way that I'm raising him if I didn't heal those things within myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. it's, I'm just always so mindful about how it impacts people around you. Yeah. Healing is contagious and has benefits outside of just ourselves. And it also works for us. If you're healing per your you know, pieces of your personal story you're also healing pieces of your business story if you're healing mm -hmm. parts of your business because it's mot you're motivated to do so because of money um surprise surprise it's also mm -hmm. going to help you heal you know pieces of your personal relationships as well yeah totally mm -hmm. okay let's talk about okay i'm just going to put it up here you're smiling because I know I know that you're gonna you're gonna share some really good stuff. Let's talk about the inner critic. Yeah, I was just talking to a group of lawyers about this last night. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and and my takeaways for them were first of all that everyone if everyone has one at least I, I don't even think if you maybe if you're a sociopath you don't have one but. Um, we all have an inner critic, and the reason we do is because it's a biological imperative. Our brain 
form, it, you know, evolved over time. And part of our old ancient brain is to keep us safe. That's it. End of story. Like survival. Don't die. And so it doesn't care how it keeps you from dying. If it needs to tell you, hey, you're being an idiot. Don't, you know, don't touch the fire again. That's stupid. Or don't be your fabulous self and like walk, be away from the group because you need them to accept you because without your, without your group, <laughs> you're going to be in trouble out there by yourself out there in the, in the, in the world. So it's primary purpose is to keep you safe, period. We mm -hmm. all have it. And so that, that inner critic kind of get evolves from that. So we have these uh, voices in our, you know, developmental years of our childhood, maybe we had a critical parent or a teacher or a pastor, or maybe even someone on TV who, who we are paying attention to, who is being, being critical or trying to contain us in some way. And so that inner, that inner critic voice for us takes on that tone, takes on that language, takes on that dynamic. And, you know, if let's say if you're like seven years old and you get bullied by your friends, your friend group turns on you. Well, that inner critic, its job is to keep you from ever fair experiencing that terrible pain again, right? So that critic is going to say, you are stupid. Don't talk so much. Or um, you need to dress like everybody else is. You, you mm -hmm. have no style. So its job is to get you back in line so you don't yeah. experience that pain again because it doesn't yeah. differentiate. And right. that's also the don't so, trust anybody critic too, right? Don't trust anybody. You can't, you can't trust them. So its job is to keep you from being in that experience again. But what I have learned over time, because I used to be the, in the crowd of shut down your inner critic, kill it, slay it, talk back to mm -hmm. it, all the things. I was there. I wrote an ebook called Fire Your Inner Critic. I did. It's not out there anymore, but I did. Um I am of the belief now that your inner critic is there to protect your inner kiddos as well. Like those younger versions mm -hmm. of you that experience some of that pain. So instead of screaming at your inner critic, shaming yourself, shutting it down, what if you were able to say, oh, I, I recognize this. My, my critic has reared their head. It's being mean to me. Wonder mm -hmm. why? Wonder why? So my questions are always, um, is this true is this real or even is this even mine as to why my critic has popped up and then to say i hear you what do you need and typically what will happen is that there's a younger version of ourselves that has felt unheard unsafe unseen in some way that that critic is trying to protect so there will be some impression maybe you'll hear hear a little voice or see a little movie in your mind of Remember when those kids, you know, bullied you and just left you out of the friend group completely? Um, this networking event feels dangerous. This, you know, going out and starting your own business when everybody else has a nine to five, it feels dangerous. We don't want to feel that way anymore. Is there a way that we cannot feel that way? This feels dangerous to us. So I don't want you to kill your inner critic. I want you to listen to it and ask it what it is trying to protect you from. You don't have to believe what it is telling you because most of the time it's not real. It's a lie, mm -hmm. but it doesn't yeah. care. It just wants to stop you in your tracks from what it is you're doing that it deems to be unsafe. Yeah. It's, so. um, <laughs> there you go. It's like the, the Elizabeth Gilbert passage about fear. Fear. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like you can go along, you can come along for the ride, but you can't change the radio station. <laughs> You cannot you change the radio station. <laughs> yeah, but you are, we know you belong here. Yeah. You are part of this. Yeah. You know, yeah. we don't want to say that you can't come along because fear is a normal and natural emotion as a human being. Um, and just like it's a normal and natural thing for your brain stem and your nervous system to want mm -hmm. to keep you safe. So sometimes, um, sometimes you might need that. <laughs> and sometimes you do. Sometimes you are it's stupid. Don't do that thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and just, you know, interesting to hear the reactions to that where most people will say, well, I've given it a name and I, I'll say, shut up Zelda or, you know, Agnes or, or whatever the name is. And I'm like, that's okay. If you want to be irreverent about this voice, yeah. that's, you know, just gotten so ridiculous, but really, honestly, I think when we can come to ourselves and that part of ourselves with compassion and curiosity, we get a mm -hmm. lot further. We, we do get a lot further.
Yeah, because that's an integration. That's a big integration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and acceptance, like acceptance of all of your parts. And mm -hmm. when you could do that, you're no longer fighting that. I, I had an experience about a year and a half ago. Um, most of my life I was fighting everything. You know, I came, I came ready for battle mm -hmm. for everything. And I just like, I was just sitting here working and something like went pop inside of me. And I was like, ah, oh, I don't have to do that anymore. I could, and I could just put that shield down. Mm -hmm. I don't need to, like, I have that. I need that maybe sometimes, but it doesn't have to be where I start. Yeah. It absolutely didn't have to be where you start. Yeah. And yeah. that was, that was big. But like you were saying earlier, that doesn't just happen. No. <laughs> that was years of, <laughs> of like delving, <laughs> unpeeling, unlayering. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Let me see. We are at 30 minutes. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. So um, tell us what happened for you when you turned 50, since this is <sighs> all about being over 50. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about this the other day. I literally feel like my life began around 50. Um, now I had a different experience and then I got diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 49 and, um, you know, spent my 50th birthday just coming, well, no, still, still in radiation. So um, I feel like maybe that experience opened my eyes a little wider than maybe just a date on a calendar. Um, but it, I feel like that my life is just beginning in that, you know, my business has reached a place where, you know, I am a go-to expert on this topic of trauma and entrepreneurship, and it's still just evolving. Like there's, yeah. there's so much I want to do here. I want to have like official research studies about this. There's just not a lot out there. There's mm -hmm. uh, anecdotal and there's people who are starting to pay attention to it, but it really needs much more attention and much more, I think, authority around it. Um, so there's so much that I want to do. I mean, I'm excited about the business. I'm excited about this topic. I'm excited about, you know, this book I wrote, how to live your business and the possibility of another one. So for me, it took me because of my own childhood trauma, which was multiple. Um, and many of those traumas played out in my adult life and, you know, mirrored, you know, toxic relationships, multiple marriages, mental health problems, health problems, you name it. Uh, I feel like that I really kind of didn't get my shit together until about the age of 45. And so for me, turning 50 has been a new chapter of possibility and really celebrating all of the work that I did do in those harder, darker, challenging years of choosing not to stay in a marriage that was toxic and, and not helpful. Well, two marriages that were not toxic, <laughs> that were toxic and not helpful. Well, you not were practicing. <laughs> I was practicing, you know, committing to, you know, years of therapy to help me with my own trauma, committing to um, always looking for a new situation that is going to be more healthy and more aligned with who I am. I've always been someone who is, a seeker and a personal development, um, you know, I, I'm av avid reader around those things. So I'm celebrating all those choices that those younger versions of me that felt really helpless and felt pretty awful mm -hmm. and pretty depressed, that there was still something in me that made the choices that have, that have gotten me here to where I am now. So my 50th, that shift into 50 for me, it was a, a, a new a new life to be able to, to have and to grow and to experience. And I'm really excited about yeah. what I get to do now. So it, it feels like just a number because I thought 50 was so old when I was younger, no. but you know, you know, no, they you say Mr. Mr. Roper was 52 when he was Mr. Roper on three's company. And I look at mm -hmm. him like, Oh my God, he was so old. Of course I think that, you know, I don't know, Gen X, like we're, I think we're aging in reverse anyway. So <laughs> Well, you still have time to be on the cover of Sports Illustrated. <laughs> Maybe. Hey, you know, Martha can do it. <laughs> okay, I have one more question for you. What do you want to leave people with? Like, what do you want them to know from just listening to you for the last 30 minutes about trauma to walk away with and maybe it would make an impact in their lives? Mm. Uh, it's not your fault. 
And um, it is by design that we don't look at it. Um, and when I say that, I mean that it is beneficial to the people and systems around us that we don't realize that we're being traumatized. It's a feature, not a bug. Mm. So it is not your fault. Um, it's never too late to start to unpack this and get help. Um, that you have inner kiddos in there that want to um, be a part of what you're doing in your life right now. And some that would really like to just take a break and be dismissed to go play and have the childhood that they always wanted. Um, and that you can do that work and it'll change your life. So if you are just hearing this for the first time and you're just curious about whether the, some of the experiences that you had that always you remembered and you felt bad about, but you weren't sure about it, get some help, you know, talk to a therapist, talk to, um, you know, someone who can hold space for you because you deserve that. You really do deserve to have your journey witnessed. And there are people out there, you know, who, who can and want to do that. So it's not your fault. If they buy a lot, your nervous system is doing what your nervous system is supposed to do. Uh, so don't let that hold you back and don't let any stigma around mental health or trauma be the thing that holds you back. Because again, that's by design. <laughs> it's by design. Yeah. And that voice, Zelda, <laughs> mm -hmm. if you're trying to do this alone, that voice, Zelda, or whatever you've coined her or him to be, um, will convince you that you don't need mm -hmm. help. Absolutely. And you'll get stuck. You will get stuck in the middle. I cannot stress um, more strongly. Mm -hmm. Get help. And yes. I, I would recommend re reaching out to Nicole. <laughs> yeah, for sure. If you're an entrepreneur or business owner, I would, mm -hmm. I'm would. i definitely around. Yeah. Um, and the worst experience of your life is the worst experience of your life. It doesn't matter whether someone else thinks it's that or not. It's yeah. still, you know, it's still valid. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you. Thank you for sharing everything yeah. with us today. And thank you for being in my world. I really appreciate you every single day. And everybody, please connect with Nicole and come back next week on Wednesday. We're going to have an interview with Jeannie Spiro, who actually Yay. introduced me to Nicole. Us. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you for doing this project, Donna. I just love uh, it. Yeah, I love it too. I'm having so much fun. And um, noon, Eastern time every Wednesday, we're here. We've got interviews booked for months and months and months in advance. Thank you. Thank you.